Good, Tom. Hello and welcome. We're live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Story Collider, where we tell true personal stories about science. Um, so tonight we are online um, and we're going to have three storytellers for you. Um, and tonight's theme is women who adventure. And it's all because of this lady next to me, Kimberly. Kimberly, you want to take it away and tell us all about why we're here? <laughs> yeah, of course. Thanks, Misha. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Kimberly Miner, and I am delighted to be joining you today from sunny Los Angeles, where it's a little bit earlier in the day. As a climate scientist and NASA engineer, I've traveled all over the world from Alaska to Antarctica in support of my research. And as I've told my stories, I felt that there were other women explorers out there with stories to share. And I wanted to create a place to start telling them. So that's why together with If Then and Lida Hill Philanthropies, I've asked Story Collider to put together this special show highlighting amazing stories from women who adventure. Uh, I'm an, I am also a AAAS If Then ambassador, one of 125 incredible women in STEM who are serving as high profile role models for young women and girls, along with Lindsay, one of our storytellers today. Supported by the Lida Hill Philanthropies, ambassadors use a variety of platforms to introduce girls to STEM paths and all of the joy and excitement those careers can bring. Tonight's show is in service to that goal, sharing stories of adventure, growth, bravery, and of course, science. So I hope you enjoy our Story Collider show and a big thank you to all of these amazing women for telling their stories tonight. Nisha? Thank you so much for having us. Um, I am so excited. Uh, goodbye, Kimberly, we're sending you back to the audience, so enjoy the show. Um, but before we jump right in, I want to take you on a tour of this delightful platform we're on, just in case you're not familiar. So um, this is Crowdcast, and on the right, you're gonna see the chat function where some of you are already posting your 10 word stories. Um, you guys should continue to do that. You can also show your support for the storytellers through emojis and exclamation marks and whatever else you wanna do in there. Um, go for it, blow up the chat, it's gonna be great. Um, also, you'll see down below my face, um, there's a polls thing and we have a poll up right now about who's here for the first time Story Collider. And we got some first timers here, which is great. I love it, hello newbies. Um, and one other special feature that we have is this ask a question. Ooh, another poll just went up, hit those buttons. Um, we have the ask a question button, which for after we hear from our storytellers, we're gonna have a Q and A. So if you have a question about one of the stories or you just have a question about the storytellers lives, ask it in the box and we'll get to it. Um, so yeah, that's the tour. And we're gonna kinda get started. Um, so I wanna just jump right in because this is an adventure. So let's get going. Um, we're gonna bring up our first storyteller, Lindsay Rustad. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her while we wait for her to join me on screen. So Lindsay is a research ecologist at the USDA Forest Service Center for Research on Ecosystems Change in Durham, New Hampshire. She's also the co-director of the USDA Northeastern Hub for Risk Adaptation and Mitigation to Climate Change and a team leader for um, the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. Uh, she's a fellow of the Soil Science Society of America, and she's also an If Then ambassador. Damn, you got a lot of things going on, Lindsay. <laughs> Welcome. Oh, so is this your first Story Collider show? Yes, it is. It what is. I'm excited to be here. Yay! Oh, we're excited to have you. Um, I also wanted to ask you about the second poll, which is how many countries have you adventured in? Me? Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not a counter like that. I don't know, but I've been all over Europe and South America and China and Canada. And so I've been I've been all over. Ooh, I'm gonna have to go back and count them. Definitely. You you can count them in your head later and answer the poll. I have a feeling you might be in the 20 plus category, but uh, all right, are you ready to tell your story? 
I am. All right, let's bring you up on stage. Okay, so I'm going to take you back um, to late afternoon on January 10th in 2009. And it's already getting dark. And I'm returning from a scientist meeting in New York City. And I'm headed back to my office in Durham, New Hampshire. And I'm kind of lost in thought. At first, I'm driving on wet roads through light rain. But as I continue north, the temperature is dropping. The rain begins to freeze and ice is forming on my windshield. And my wipers are beginning to do that thong, 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 thunk as they strain to move the slush. Worse, I'm beginning to notice a glare coming from the road surface as it too is beginning to freeze. I realize I'm driving in an ice storm. Soon, cars in the lane ahead of me are beginning to slip. I tighten my hold on my steering wheel. I start grinding my teeth. Now a car up ahead of me is fishtailing, it's skidding, it's sliding off the road to my right. Others follow. Branches, whole trees, even power poles crushed by the ice storm are strewn across the highway, making a grim obstacle course for me. I continue driving at a crawl through that cold, dark, icy night. I'm terrified. I don't want to slide. I don't want to crash. And I don't want to die. I finally make it to my office in Durham. I'm safe, but I'm kind of shaking. I see the light in my colleague John Campbell's office. Now, John is usually a comforting soul with a strong, chiseled face and usually lit up by a brilliant smile. Tonight, John is working late, and I knock on his door. I step into his office, and I say, what the heck was that? John is uncharacteristically agitated tonight as he too has been watching the storm unfold from his own windows. As forest ecologists, we're both thinking, if an ice storm can do that much damage along roadways, what could it do to a forest? That began my obsession with ice storms, and I decided on the spot that I needed to know more. I soon learned four things about ice storms. One, ice storms are a big deal. Two, they happen all over the world. Three, climate change is making them worse. And four, we know virtually nothing about them because they're super unpredictable and they're hard to study. But I was determined to study ice storms. And instead of waiting for the next big ice storm to hit, I had a crazy idea. Why not make our own ice storms at our own outdoor laboratory at the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest? It would be risky because it could fail and it could be dangerous and someone could get hurt, but it's never been done before, so why not try? I hesitantly posed this idea to John, and I was surprised at how quickly he was on board with the concept of making our very own extreme weather. So to make our experiment, we turned to Ian Hom. Now, Ian Hom is a site manager at Hubbard Brook, and he's also a Forest Service firefighter. So with Ian's help, we put together firefighting pumps, hoses, nozzles, and we soon figured out how to make our very own ice storms. Now that we could do it, John and I gathered up a team of over 40 scientists from all over New England to do the actual experiment. Our plan was to ice 10 large plots in our outdoor laboratory. Each plot, to give you a sense of it, is about the size of a basketball court, and each was assigned a treatment from no ice to moderate ice to extreme ice. And recalling my terror from when I drove through that 2009 ice storm and knowing that safety is everything in this extreme experiment, I was determined to prepare our team for every kind of danger I could think of, from falling on the ice, to getting rolled over by an ATV, to hypothermia, to even getting lost in the forest in the middle of the night. So I made us practice the icing technique over and over and over under easy conditions in the summer so we would be perfect when the time arrived to ice for real in the winter. I required everyone to have radios to communicate with each other in the dark, everyone to have a buddy, everyone to be dressed in protective rain gear, layers of warm clothes, helmets, face masks, even goggles. I made sure we had a warming tent, a medical transport snowmobile sled, and not one but two EMTs on site at all time. I was pumped and everything was ready. So now it's January 15th and it's 2016. The conditions are perfect for making ice. 
Because we have to ice at night when temperatures are coldest, we've already laid out all the equipment during the day, the pumps, gas cans, hoses, generators, lights. And we have put three bright orange five gallon buckets out in each of the plots to catch the water that might not freeze and will come down through the trees. So now it's 7.08 p.m. Everyone is in place on a moderate ice storm plot. We're ready to go. I'm standing near to Ian as he's busy priming the pump by the stream. I'm stomping my feet nervously in the cold and I'm worried, what if the experiment fails? Have I wasted everyone's time? Or worse, what if someone gets hurt while we're trying this experiment that's never been done before? My thoughts are interrupted by the roar of the pump as it catches and turns over, followed by a great sucking sound as the pump begins to slurp water up from the stream and pushes it up through the hoses. The team starts spraying water up and up and up and over the treetops, and the water is falling back down on the branches, freezing the trees on contact, just like it's supposed to do. Whew, I feel a wave of relief. The experiment seems to be working. After creating about a quarter inch of ice, branches are beginning to droop downward and ice coated twigs are beginning to break and fall. We keep icing. We get closer to half an inch of ice. Tree branches are starting to crack under the weight of the frozen water. They're booming and crashing down with great thuds. The team cheers with the fall of each branch. I cheer too, as each down branch is something new for me to study. At 1.16 in the morning, we finished making a moderate ice storm. We stopped to take a break and admire our work. I'm elated. I'm almost giddy. This experiment that I've been nurturing for five years is finally happening. Next up is an extreme ice storm plot. We've never added this much ice to the forest before, and I don't know what to expect. So far, everything has gone like clockwork and everyone is safe. But adding this much ice I'm worried again that something's going to go wrong. It's 1.45 a.m. Everyone is back in place. The streamside pump roars into action and we start icing the forest again. We go through the same phases as the first plot, but when we get to half an inch of ice, we keep on icing. Somewhere between half an inch and three quarters of an inch of ice, bigger branches start breaking. Tree trunks are snapping and whole tree tops are crashing down all around us shredding and ripping the tree trunks as they fall. The sound is deafening, and I am awestruck by the power of the storm we're creating. We finally finish at 5.28 a.m. in the morning. The plot looks like a bomb has exploded in it, and we are all exhausted. Everyone returns to headquarters, everyone that is except John and me. Okay, it's now 6.15 a.m. It's winter, so it's still dark, and now it's eerily quiet with the pumps off and the team gone. Surveying the broken forest, I have a grim satisfaction that we've created the world's first ever experimental ice storm. It's pretty cool, but we're not quite done yet. John and I still have to retrieve the buckets. We collect the three buckets from the moderate ice storm without a hitch, and then it's time for the extreme ice plot. I eye it warily. Down trees and branches shrouded in ice are strewn like carcasses on the ground. I'm going to have to be careful, very, very careful not to slip or slide on the ice. I step gingerly into one of the pots. I get a bucket. I hand it to John. I go to the other side of the pot. I get another bucket. I hand it to John. It's time for the last bucket on a third side. I step into the plot for the last time. John is two feet behind me, just outside the plot, ready to retrieve the bucket. I am reaching, stretching my hands out for the bucket. But as I'm about to grab the bucket, I hear it creaking overhead. And just as I'm looking up towards the sound, a huge branch caught up in an ice jam at the top of a tree lets loose, and it comes careening down towards me with a thunderous clatter. I turn feral with fear. Fueled by pure survival instinct, I catapult myself out of the plot, a loud scream caught in my throat. But I fly out, I, the queen of safety, I grab onto John and I push John into the plot as I use him to leverage my way out. 
The branch crashes to the ground, shattering on the ice not far from where I've just been standing a few seconds earlier. I spin around in horror. My stomach is heaving. I am desperately afraid that the branch is skewered, John. I'm expecting the worst. Phew. John is there. John's unhurt. He's intact. But he's wagging his finger at me under his icy helmet, saying ruefully, Really, Lindsay? You just pushed me into a plot under a falling branch to save yourself? Really? I am so relieved, I almost cry. It was a miss, a near miss as we call it in the Forest Service. It could have been a lot worse. I felt terrible and ashamed that after all my careful planning, it was me who put my own safety first and put my friend in peril. However, that near miss changed me forever. It has given me an even higher commitment to safety. And it's given me a deep appreciation that no matter how carefully and logically we plan, bad things can happen. And raw human emotions are as powerful and unpredictable as ice storms. Thank you for listening to my story and stay safe. <laughs> bravo, bravo. Oh. What a nail biting story, honestly. So, so many stakes in that. Um, I kind of want to know, like, as terrifying as ice storms are, what's like your favorite part about them? Uh, you know, my favorite part is they're sublimely beautiful. So, there's this conundrum that when they start, you know, with the sun or the moonlight coming down and they're kind of tinkling and they're one of the most beautiful events that nature creates. And then they go through those phases of building up ice. And they go from sublime to terrifying in the space of just a couple hours. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I can only imagine how cool it must have been to watch like you create this and go through all those phases. And now you know more about ice storms, which is like the main goal. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm going to send you back to the audience um, and we're going to keep the show rolling. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's check in on our poll. We got some pretty big adventures in the audience. There's four people who have at least gone to 20 plus countries, which is crazy. Well done, guys. Um, I think we're going to put up a, another poll soon um, all about female adventurers because that's what our show is about, female adventurers. Um, so I want to know who's y'all's favorite adventurer. Um, and let's, we, I know you guys have been posting some of your 10 word stories in the chat. So let's see what we got. Um, okay, so 10 word stories about your favorite adventure. And we have one from Devin um, who says, 30 feet up on a cherry picker to catch a bird. I have questions, Devin. Um, why were you trying to catch said bird? What kind of bird? Uh, that seems very high up. I would probably get vertigo. Um, I probably wouldn't touch a bird because I have a terrible phobia of them and would just, um, I, in my brain, I think that if a bird touches me, I will die. It's not true, but that's how it works in my head. Um, but yeah, let's uh, keep posting your 10 word stories in the chat. I love hearing them. I love reading them. So add some more. Um, and we're going to bring up our second storyteller. So um, we're going to bring up Erin Bonilla. Um, and while she comes up on screen, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. So Erin is the VP of training programs at Star Harbor Space Academy, the world's first publicly accessible space training academy and R&D campus. Um, previously, she worked at NASA headquarters as a digital strategist, designer, and project manager. And before that, she worked in fashion. Hello and welcome, Erin. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm just it's great. <laughs> Having a good day. Yay. Awesome. Um, I want to know how many countries have you adventured to? You know, I was trying to count after you said that earlier, and I think I'm right around the 10 mark might be more or less than that. I have to sit down and like sit, look at a map and count, but somewhere around there. 
That's a pretty good number. Yeah. Good. Do you have any like other ones on your list? You're raring to go? Oh, the list is, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot on that list, I'll tell you. <laughs> I am <laughs> glad things are starting to open up a little bit more again. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I definitely miss traveling. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do. But are you ready to tell your story? Sure. All right. Take it away. The stage is yours. Awesome. So there are two things you need to know about me. One, my dreams are not small. And two, I love a good adventure. I attribute much of this passion to camping with my family in the Adirondack Mountains. So many great memories of swimming in the lake with my cousins, surrounded by mountains, and going on adventures in the forest. But one adventure that I never thought would be possible in my life was seeing Everest with my own eyes. In fall 2016, I was studying adventure education with a concentration in space training management. A trip to Everest base camp would allow me to apply my learning, teach me how to run those expeditions myself, and satisfy my dream of seeing Everest. After much planning and a few short years later, I had booked the trip. I am going to Everest. <laughs> a lot of learning and fitness was needed to get ready, so I continued with my studies and built fitness training programs to ensure I was prepared. About seven months before my trip, I'm sitting in the pilot seat, strapped in tight, running through a comms check. The cabin around me was cold, reminiscent of a submarine with small circular windows and a large steel door. And with a loud clunk, the door locked and the cabin began to pressurize. Just like that, we were airborne and on our way to 22,000 feet. The thing is, I wasn't actually sitting in a plane. I was firmly placed on the ground, sitting inside a hypobaric chamber. I was participating in a training scenario to identify my personal hypoxia symptoms should a cabin leak take place on my way to space. Yes, space, <laughs> bad space up there. Um, I was determined to experience as many space simulated environments as possible to ensure I would be ready for my next career goal, to train commercial astronauts. <laughs> <laughs> Pilot 003, turn to heading 120. As I shifted the yoke toward the new heading, I began to feel a faint aching in my lower back. Seriously, is my back going to give out now? Will this ruin my chances of completing this training? No, no, no. I'll be fine. You know, and I just chalked it up to having to sit in a classroom too long the day before. I then, uh, sorry. Uh, I then remove my oxygen mask and begin to feel the symptoms of hypoxia. First, my cheeks felt warm. Then I had a tingling sensation in my hands and then cold feet right at the end. I was instructed to put my oxygen mask back on and then they brought us back down to a normal pressure. Then it was time to stand up. Something isn't right. The pain begins to get worse with an odd sharp twinge. I exit the chamber and seat myself on a chair. I try to stretch a bit, but the pain continues to get worse. I kept repeating to myself, please don't give out. Please don't give out. God, please don't give out. <clears throat> when the final training group wrapped up and we all went to dinner, I knew I was in bad shape and I was sitting on a wooden chair and it was causing excruciating pain. I told a few people around me that my back was giving me problems, but I didn't make a big fuss about it. All I could think was, I can just push through this. I've had stuff like this before. I got better, I'll be fine. Then I got up from the table and I couldn't walk. I'm frozen in the standing position. If I try to take a step, my body wants to collapse. The pain is unlike anything I had experienced before. My muscles are spasming in my lower back, which is sending pain shooting down my legs. What is happening to me? Is this the end of my dream? Would this end my chances of seeing Everest? Once back in the hotel, my roommate looks at me with concern and immediately recognizes the state that I was in. I yell out in pain every time my back spasms uncontrollably. 
she jumps into problem solving mode and calls for help. With first responders on the way, she calls my husband to come be with me. I am forever grateful for her help. When the first responders arrive, they can see how much pain I am in and I get an IV of pain medication. I vaguely remember getting inside the ambulance and can't remember a whole bunch, whole bunch more after that. <laughs> Still in a drug-induced haze, they released me from the hospital. Unsure of the official diagnosis, the doctor sent me home with medication to reduce the swelling and pain. My husband and I get back to the hotel. I lay down on the bed. He sits down next to me and he says, Aaron, you're going to have to get this under control or you can't go to Everest. I won't be there to help you if this happens out in the Himalayas. <laughs> Laying there, I feel scared, defeated, and in the worst pain of my life. The hypoxia training and my big plans for Everest are all part of my bigger plan to work in astronaut training. Would this end all the hard work I had put in up until now? Would I fail at something so epically that I would have to change my career? I had more questions than answers and way too much time to think about it. I could feel my dream of Everest withering away before my eyes. As tears began to roll down my face, I thought, I have to do something. I won't give up on this dream. I can do this. And that kicked off my road to recovery. Come hell or high water, I was going to Everest and then I returned home. Seven months until Everest. I pick up the phone and I hear my doctor on the line. He explains the culprit as underused muscles deep in my glutes from sitting at a computer. Surprise, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people have that right now. Um, those muscles are putting pressure on the sciatic nerve causing shooting pains down my leg. The great part is it's treatable. I'll just need to go to physical therapy for 12 to 14 weeks. Uh, but it's doable. That's three months. I, I can get that done and still go to Everest. I learned some new stretches, strengthening exercises. I further enhanced my daily exercise with swimming and hiking plans, um, ju just to build up a lot of uh, strength and endurance for my 100-mile journey ahead. A few weeks later, I'm sitting in the physical therapy waiting room, and all I could think about was, like, what is going on? Like, I am putting in the work but I'm not seeing results yet. These sessions are going by way too fast. Am I gonna run out of time? Am I not gonna be ready? Like all the questions started flooding into my mind. But about a month later, my physiotherapist sat me down. He said, do you understand why pain happens? At first I thought it was a trick question, but then I could see in his eyes he was being serious. He suggested I read a book he had prescribed to all of his clients which helped exponentially in their recovery. I figured, what the heck, I'll give it a shot. The book broke down the fundamentals of how our body sends us signals when we are injured. A pain in one area of the body may be indicative of an injury in another. It might hurt, but pain is a good thing. It's our body telling us there's something going on. The book has also prompted me to reflect on how the power of knowledge and how maintaining positivity can help in that healing process. I have new tools in my toolbox and I'm going to use them and I'm going to get better. Three months later, I'm standing on the Kumbu Glacier looking up at Everest with the midday sun warming my face. Tears start rolling down my cheeks again. This time they were tears of joy and pride. I couldn't believe it. Just seven months ago, I was unable to walk and doubted this moment would ever happen. But now here I am, my dream has been realized. Thoughts of those camping trips and the loving push I needed from my husband flashed before my eyes. All that hard work and, and the support from my family and fr friends made this possible and I had done it. Thank you. Yay, you did it. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> oh, great story. Um, I, I'm just one. I'm kind of in awe of your radio sound. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I should go into voiceover, right? <laughs> yeah, sound effects, brilliant. Like, if this whole astronaut training thing doesn't work out, sound effects. <laughs> it's all good. I'll be on mission control. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> oh. 
what was your um, favorite part about the Everest kind of like getting to the top and the base camp and everything? You know, um, the, the, my favorite part was actually the hardest day of the entire trek up there. It was this point where we had to go across a mountain pass that was actually the top of it was higher than Everest Base Camp. It was like this long, long day going way up. I think it reached 17,800 feet at the top. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like a 10 hour day of basically uphill. And then when we came over the other side, we had to put on uh, spikes and go down basically an ice fall on the other side. <laughs> Um, and it, you know, a few tears were shed. I might've slipped on the ice a few times. Like it was one of those days where by the end, I was like, so proud that I just made it through. And now it's the thing that sticks in my head as like the most important, like thing that I, I accomplished on that trip. I feel you that, um, I did the Machu Picchu Inca trail a few mm -hmm. years back. And the hardest day was when you, um, they have like a day where you do like three different elevations and your like whole body's just kind of like, what are you doing? Could you uh -huh. see? <laughs> but that was one of my favorite days too. And mm -hmm. um, the thing about Machu Picchu is like all of it is um, these like very polished stones because so many people have walked. So it's like ice sometimes. So I wiped out hard. <laughs> oh yeah. I had one good wipe out where I sat on the ground for a few minutes, like, all right, I'm okay. Like, I wasn't quite sure, but I'm like, I'm okay. And then thankfully I didn't fall anymore that day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had one of that and I like immediately sat up and I was like, did anyone, did anyone see me? And like, basically, like <laughs> the one and only time there was no like Sherpas or anything on the trail. Oh, wow. I was like, I managed to fall with no one around. This is amazing. <laughs> Congratulations. Everyone saw my fall. And I, I had another one before that. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for telling your story. Congratulations. You did it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to send you back to the audience. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so Oh, two great stories down, only one to go. Um, if you've loved listening to our stories, um, you can check out more stories. Um, there are stories of adventure. There's also just other stories about science and people's lives. Um, so check it out on the podcast. Our omnipresent um, tech behind the scenes, just put it in that button there. Um, Emma is our omnipresent tech behind the scenes today. Um, she's doing a great job and kind of working everything and making sure it's all good. And um, yeah, let's check out the polls. How are we doing? Um, ooh, Amelia Earhart is winning this female adventurer thing. Did anyone post a different one that I don't know about in the chat? Ooh, maybe. Um, and we have another 10 word story that Emma just sent me. Um, this one is from, who's this one from? I don't know. Um, but driving away from a Miami, from Miami, Florida as a hur as Hurricane Andrew makes landfall. Oh my God, that sounds terrifying. Um, but I'm glad you had a great adventure. <laughs> and another one, um, ooh. So the hurricane story was from Laura. And ooh, we have another one. Um, May Jemison is another favorite adventurer, lady adventurer. Um, we're gonna put up a last poll. Um, so this one, where's the next place you wanna go on an adventure? As things open up, we get to go places. I would go to any of these places um, at any point, but alas, I am still very much confined to Canada. Um, all right. Let's bring up our third and final storyteller, Marley Parker. Uh, while she comes up on stage, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her. Um, so Marley Parker is a professional photographer, videographer, and science writer. She specializes in capturing science in remote places. Um, from Antarctica to the middle of the Pacific Ocean, she has joined dozens of international scientific research expedition. Um, she's worked on projects sponsored by the National Science Foundation, NASA, the Ocean Exploration Trust, the Woods and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and many others. <laughs> Welcome, Marley. Hi. 
Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm awesome. I am so happy to be here. Yay. So where's your next place you want to adventure? Beach, mountain, city, space? I I was hoping you would ask me that. Um, my number one country that I want to go to is Nepal. Uh, I really want to talk to Aaron about the Everest Base Camp trek because I've heard it's literally one of the most beautiful treks in the world. Um, but yeah, also Mars, definitely. Mars seems like a cool place. I'll talk to her about that too. <laughs> yeah, she, Aaron just seems like the person you talk about all all of your adventures. <laughs> We, we already have a, a Zoom date for next week, so thanks for bringing us together. <laughs> you are so welcome. This is yeah. the most adorable thing that uh, I've ever heard. I'm so excited that you guys are being friends. Yay. Um, all right. You ready to tell your story? Definitely. Let's do right. it. Take it away. All right. So it is January of 2015, and I am riding in the back seat of a pickup truck that is barreling down a two-lane road in a remote part of southern Chile. I am sitting directly behind the driver. Uh, the man driving the truck is named Jonathan, and he is a geophysicist in his mid-50s. Uh, he's kind of a stereotypical nerd, he wears really thick glasses and he gets this little twinkle in his eye whenever he talks about earth science. So he pulls the truck around another bend in the road and he points through a gap in the trees and says, look, that's it. And he's pointing at this giant snow covered volcano. It's called Yaima and it is one of the largest and most active volcanoes in all of South America. I stare at this huge, steep, icy mountain, and I'm kind of in disbelief that I am here. <laughs> I have been working as a professional photographer and a science communicator for a couple of years now, and occasionally I have the opportunity to join scientists for a day or two of field work, but I have never done anything like what I'm about to do here in Chile which is spend the next two weeks documenting a geophysical research expedition on that huge volcano. Needless to say, I am a little bit nervous and also really excited. Uh, at dinner that night, Jonathan introduces me to the other expedition leader. I am gonna call him Sean. Sean immediately strikes me as a somewhat self-absorbed individual. He's very cocky. When he finally finishes talking about himself, his focus abruptly shifts to me and he says, so what kind of mountaineering experience do you have? And I tell him about backpacking in North Carolina, where I'm from. And he asks me if I've ever used an ice axe or if I've ever worn crampons. And obviously I can tell he is sizing me up. And I want to tell him that you know, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape. I, I just ran a marathon last year. I'm pretty fit. I can handle it. But instead, I just shake my head and say, no, I've never used an ice axe. And he says, well, you're not going to the summit then. And that one simple statement feels kind of like a slap in the face. I want to argue with him. I want to defend myself and make my case and say, look, man, just because I'm a small woman doesn't mean I can't handle going up a big mountain. But the conversation has already shifted to equipment and logistics, so I don't say anything. Uh, fortunately, the entire expedition is not just centered around going to the summit. We are planning to place seismometer equipment all over the volcano. So the next morning, I hop into one of the trucks with four other guys on the team. Uh, they're all in their late 20s, early 30s. They're all men and they're all very fit. I sit next to a young geophysicist named Tim. I immediately notice his very buff arms and calloused hands. He, uh, he has this goofy smile and he's from Idaho, but he talks kind of like a surfer bum and he describes almost everything as super gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> and I, we ride out to the national park to get to the volcano and the whole way I'm listening to Tim and all the other guys talk about all the other expeditions they've been on. 
And they talk really casually about things like rope management on crevasse crossings or emergency backcountry rescue plans. And I listen intently to everything, but I do not say much, especially after my brief conversation with Sean last night, I really don't wanna draw any more attention to my lack of experience. When we get to our first work site on the volcano, the guys immediately start unloading all the equipment and I kind of fumble with my camera trying to take photos without getting in the way. It uh, very quickly becomes apparent that I am the only person here who is not a geophysicist. I feel a little, you know, self-conscious and insecure and I start to create a list in my head of all the things I'm clueless about down here. For example, I have no idea how a seismometer works. I don't know how to use a compass. I did not bring enough water and I definitely should not have worn shorts. <laughs> As the day goes on, it becomes a very, very long day. And we go to a bunch of different sites on the volcano. Late in the day, we're working at a pretty high elevation where the wind is relentless. And Tim walks over and stares at the goosebumps that are all over my legs. And he says, aren't you cold? And I say, no, I'm fine. <laughs> and he chuckles and says, okay, tough stuff. When we finally get back to the truck at the end of the day, we're packing up everything. And Sean glances over at me, takes one hard long look at me, and then makes a general statement to the whole group about proper attire for field work. Now, I already feel self-conscious about being the only newbie on the team. I am also the only woman on the team. And now I'm on top of everything else having to deal with these underhanded comments from some of the guys on the team. But I know that if I try to stand up for myself or call them out on it, it's just gonna make me seem even more sensitive or weak or more like an outsider. So again, I just don't say anything. I try to ignore it, I try to shove it down. We finally get back to base camp late that night and I collapse into bed completely exhausted, but my mind is racing. And as I'm laying there, I start to think all these things and I really start to doubt myself and I wonder, Maybe, maybe Sean's right. Maybe I just don't have the background or the right experience. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. And it seems like it would be really easy right now to just kind of fall into this mental black hole of self-doubt. But instead, my mind automatically shifts in the opposite direction. And I fall asleep that night with one thought in my head. I am going to be a competent member of this team. About five days later, I am riding in another truck back out to the volcano, this time with Jonathan and Tim. And we get to the entrance of the national park. I lean out the window to show our permit to the Chilean park ranger and chat for a few minutes. After he waves us through, Jonathan thanks me for translating. And I smile and say, de nada. And I'm starting to finally feel a tiny bit more confident. After being down here for a week, I now know how to properly pack for our long days on the volcano. And it turns out I'm one of the only people on the team that speaks Spanish. So I've become an unofficial translator. And I've taken quite a few good photos. I'm doing my job. And Tim has taught me how to use a compass. And Jonathan has told me a lot about the inner workings of volcanoes and how his seismometers track their activity. So I spend that entire day working with Jonathan and Tim in the middle of a field of volcanic ash. And at one point I take my boot off and dump this gritty hard ash out of my boot. And Jonathan tells me that this particular type of ash is called tephra, which is just one of the many different pyroclastic materials that can shoot out of the volcano during an eruption. 
And I scoop up a handful of this stuff and stare at it. And I can suddenly see why Jonathan lights up when he talks about earth science, because it really is remarkable that we can hold in our hands and touch and feel something that was once deep inside the planet. Later in the afternoon, Jonathan randomly asked me, hey, do you know how to drive a stick shift? And I proudly say, why, yes, actually I do. <laughs> and he tosses me the keys to the truck and says, can you go grab some equipment? It's about a kilometer that way. I take the keys, jump in the truck, feeling pretty cool. I put the truck into first gear and I can hear the crunch of the hardened ash under the tires. And y'all, it feels like I am driving across the surface of Mars. <laughs> So I get the equipment, I bring the truck back, I casually toss the keys back to Jonathan. And in that moment, I think, you know what? I can do this. There are still a lot of things I don't know about expedition work, and I still have an enormous amount to learn. But this is really cool. And joining a team of scientists way out in some wild remote place and documenting the entire process, that's something I wanna do more often. That's something that I want to be my job. That's my story, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, love a good triumph story. And also I think we can all admit Sean is the worst, um, the actual level. <laughs> Yeah, they, you know, you get some of those, especially when you're working in male dominated environments. So, yeah, you got to deal with it. It is, I mean, I uh, mean, but if Sean could see you now, he'd know you're a total badass who does this all the time. So, suck it, Sean. <laughs> yeah, I still have to go back to Yaima and uh, go up to the summit. That's still on the list of things to do. I've done, I've climbed a lot of other volcanoes since then. <laughs> I still haven't been back to that one yet, so that'll happen. And then I'll feel like I've come full circle, I think. <laughs> You'll have to come back and share that story when you do. <laughs> I would love to. Yeah, that'll be a special day for sure. Obviously, it, it holds a it holds a special spot in my heart. So for sure. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. We're gonna briefly send you back to the audience until yeah. the end of time. Um, but thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for having me. It's awesome to be here. All right. So that is the storytelling part of our show. Um, our Q&A is going to start shortly. So if you have questions for our storytellers, please put them in the ask a question um, box and we'll get to asking them. Um, but we also, if you like this show, we have more story collider shows coming up. Um, our tech is going to post the link in the chat to the upcoming shows. There it is. Um, next week, we're doing a really cool special show um, with a theme called Take Note, and it's highlighting voices from the disabled community in STEM. Um, so definitely come check that one out. I'm going to be hosting again um, with one, another one of our producers, Skylar. So that's going to be great. Um, but yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming to this show. Um, I just want to say thank you to our storytellers for working so hard on their stories and sharing their adventures um, with us. I want to thank our tech Emma behind the scenes for making sure everything ran smoothly. Um, I want to thank Sarah uh, Missouri, who uh, helped produce the show with me. Um, and I want to thank our directors, um, Aaron and Nissa, who are just a generally supportive uh, directors with Story Collider. Um, and I want to thank you, the audience. And I also want to thank Kimberly so much for making this show happen. So thank you, everyone. Um, that's the show. But now we're going to do Q&A. So we're going to invite all the storytellers back on screen. Um, I have questions. I bet you guys have questions. Um, also found out that people have some really cool bucket list places to go. Uh, Devin wants to go to the deep sea to hang with anglerfishes. Um, all right, Devin. <laughs> and Lindsay, you want to go back to Chile? <laughs> yeah. All right. And we're all back. Yay! <laughs> all right. We ready for questions? 
Okay. First one is for Lindsay. Of all the forest ex um, forest you've experienced, which one is your favorite and why? So it's without a doubt the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in the beautiful White Mountains of, of New Hampshire. And um, that's because where I work. Um, and the, the Hubbard Brook, if you can think of it, is just a big outdoor laboratory. So it's just an amazing place. It's one of the, the longest continuously running ecosystem study sites in, in the world. And it's filled with these amazing people, this long-term research. And then we do these big, bold experiments like the one I was talking about. So Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, shout out. All right. <laughs> Going to have to check it out one day. Um, sounds cool. Erin, other than climbing Everest, what's your greatest accomplishment? Also, same question goes for everyone else. <laughs> Although you didn't. Um, <laughs> I, you know, the first one that comes to mind is I got my skydiving license. Uh, how many years ago now? A while back, but it was a big effort to get that. And, you know, it. But, and one of the things that was amazing about it is you're really kind of thrown out there to like figure it out. You know, like they, they hold your hand just for a little bit for 25 jumps and then you're off on your own to just, you know, you've got people that are like, you can talk to and, and maybe find mentors and stuff like that, but there's not a whole lot of hand holding after that initial um, A license that you get. So that was a big accomplishment for me. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's cool. I didn't know that they didn't really hold your hand with skydiving. I thought you just got strapped to someone. No, <laughs> they do for a few jumps, but not for the, the, you know, once you get past and get your license, then you're kind of on your own. <laughs> All right, Marley, what's your um, biggest accomplishment? I I love this question. Another way I've heard it phrased is what's the most hardcore thing you've ever done? And uh, I always say, I'm like, oh yeah, well, I've climbed these mountains and I've gone swimming with sharks. I've also gone skydiving and done all these extreme things. But for me, my biggest accomplishment and the most extreme thing I've ever done was quit my job and start my own business. That was uh, that was a big one. That's still the thing that I'm the most proud of. So um, it's going really well. I did that three and a half years ago and um, just it gets better every year. So that feels really good. Awesome. Congrats. That is a huge accomplishment. Thank you. Lindsay, what about you? So I'm glad I was third. Um, it was running through my head about the, the different experiments that I've done from acidifying ecosystems to warming them to droughting them to doing ice storms. And then I was thinking of some of my personal adventures of hiking the Appalachian Trail or fly fishing in Chile, which is why I wanted to go back there. But then just in my heart of heart, I realized the thing that I'm, I'm most proud of and is probably the hardest thing I've ever done is to balance work, really busy work and a family with um, bringing up three kids. Yeah, I can only imagine. I do not have children, so we not know about that. But, <laughs> but yeah, I can imagine that being a difficult one. Um, for everyone, what has been the hardest part of adventuring? And that's from Cindy. Hmm. I can go if we okay. want. <laughs> yeah. uh, for me, the hardest part is, especially when it's a new thing, like a new place or a new activity is the getting ready for it. Like being there, you can kind of like figure it out. It can be challenging in the moment, that kind of stuff. But it's the making sure I have everything I need and it's all planned properly. Like I'm a, I'm a planner, if you can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, like that for me is like, that's the hardest part. Cause if I have that done, then the rest will just, you know, you'll deal with the challenges as they come up. But it's that initial like setting the, thing on rail so you can accomplish it. Does anyone have anything else that they find particularly challenging about adventuring? 
Yeah, so so I was going to just jump in and, you know, I think of my, my adventuring in, in my work for the USDA Forest Service and creating these really big, large, long-term experiments. And, and it just takes a long, long time to pull them together. So that ice storm experiment was five years in the making, you know, so you have to persevere, you have to keep going, you keep trying the next step, trying to figure out how it works. And then you get everything in place. And then there's that moment right, where, you know, you turn the pump on, you know, the water goes up, and it's like, oh, my God, is it going to work or, or not, <laughs> you know, so, so it finally, you know, doesn't always work, um, but, but it's just the patience, these things are, are big and bold, they take a lot of people, a lot of time, um, so it's just the, the patience, I think. Yeah, Brian, what about you? Ugh, mine's kind of personal, but I'll put it out there. It's important. Uh, it's my own self-doubt, like I've talked about in my story. I mean, I did overcome that sense of self-doubt really quickly when I was in Chile, and that's part of why it was such a big, you know, life-changing experience for me. But it's something I still deal with a lot, especially because I am self-employed and I run my own business. and. You know, I, I am my own worst critic. People tell me all the time that I've done a great job and I'm like, could I have done better? You know, what, what am I doing next? What, how can I continue to learn and grow and be as good as I can possibly be? So it's, I guess it's a, a good problem to have, but it is a problem some days. I really feel like I'm not good enough. I get the imposter syndrome stuff, you know, that's, Again, being a woman and working in a lot of male-dominated environments, you really have to have a tough mental outlook on things because uh, you can, I mean, other people can beat you down, but I nobody beats me down worse than I do. So <laughs> I'm working on it, but it's, it's definitely a thing. Yeah, for sure. I feel that. Yeah. All right. Um, question for the whole group. What's your next adventure? I'll go, mine's coming up. Uh, I leave in about six weeks to go on board the Nautilus, um, the Ocean Exploration Trust vessel. Uh, this will be my third season on that ship. And I'm really looking forward to it. It's a great group of people and uh, a lot of really amazing adventurers. Um, so yeah, actually some of my Nautilus friends are, uh, here tonight, which is really cool. And some of my other shipmates are also on. So thank y'all for coming. <laughs> oh, I <think> Marley's friends. <laughs> Lindsay, what about you? What's your next adventure? Oh gosh. You know, I, I personal and professional ones. My, my personal one is under COVID, we bought one of those little teardrop trailers and we're going to fly fish our way across the country and back um, this October. That's awesome. That's so cool. I've always wanted one of those little teardrop trailers. I've been like looking at them to see how expensive they are. They're way out of my budget right now, but they're cool. <laughs> they're very cool. They're like space capsules. <laughs> they are. You just can't get out of it the whole time. <laughs> and what about you? What's your next adventure? Um, well, actually, it's kind of not my adventure, but I'm living uh, through my my best friend. Uh, her name's Dr. Cyan Proctor. She was selected to go up to space in September on the Inspiration Four mission, and so I've been helping her, like, kind of get ready and and prepared for that. And so, you know, I'll be in basically in Florida for 20 days or something um, it, around surrounding that launch in September. So it'll be very exciting. And it's not a, you know, normal adventure, but it's an it's definitely an adventure. <laughs> it's an adventure. That's so when cool. your friend is launching into space, you know, you got to be there. So yeah, of course, you got to be there. You are right there. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, all right, we got a question from Diana. I'm interested in hearing about Aaron's journey from fashion to space training. Ah, that's a long story, but I'll keep it really short. Um, yeah, I, I actually started in design and my dream was always to work in fashion advertising. That was like, that was the job I was going to have. And so my undergrad degree is actually in graphic design. 
Um, and, and so I ended up working in that industry for a little while and I wasn't fulfilled by it anymore. I realized I was just selling overpriced jeans to people instead of, and I, I don't want to belittle that job. It just wasn't the one for me. And so I ended up hearing about another opportunity to work at NASA doing basically the same thing, but it was educational outreach instead of advertising <laughs> or communications type stuff. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll give it a try. And it was like, there was no turning back from there. I caught the space bug. That's what a lot of people say in the industry. But, um, and you know, after many years of working there, I got inspired. I worked with astronauts, did a whole bunch of stuff and it, it made me want to go into astronaut training. And so I actually went back to school and I talked about that in my story, but, um, to make that transition happen. So it, it's a funny story, but uh, it, it works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, now you have like the coolest job and you also got to like make your own degree and stuff, which is so mm -hmm. small. Uh, yeah. yeah, you also got me that adventure. Uh, wait, what? what is your degree called again? Adventure something? Adventure education. education. <laughs> it's similar to outdoor. Uh, education. I, you've probably seen that at different schools and stuff like that. Similar kind of concept. Yeah, a lot of my friends who were camp counselors ended up in outdoor education. <laughs> I but wish I knew about I love it. yours because it's going to be it's going to be the degree of the future. You know. Uh -huh. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> That's so cool. Um. All right. Uh, question from. Maybe Marley, if the Chile expedition was the starting point of your science career, what's been the high point of it thus far? Um, I mean, it's hard to beat spending my 30th birthday in Antarctica. <laughs> that was pretty amazing. That was right after I left my job and started my own business. So that was definitely a high point. Um, I don't know. I mean, when people ask me, there, I think there was another question in the chat about what my favorite adventure has been. And I've been so fortunate to go on over a dozen international expeditions at this point. But my, if I have to pick just one expedition as my favorite, it's the, it's the Chile one, because that's, that's what set me on this entire path to start mm -hmm. with me doing the work I'm doing now if I hadn't gone to Chile. Um, I mean, maybe I would have life is crazy and unpredictable, but um, that really, you know, put me on a path in a very clear way. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know, there's there's so many things. <laughs> Just, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for all of it. I'll, maybe when I write a book one day, I'll figure out if there was one perfect moment that was higher than any other, but so far they're all pretty great moments. <laughs> For sure. All right. Uh, question for everyone. Um, if someone wants to become a mentor to others, what's the skill that is most needed toward helping others to find and complete these kind of adventures? Communication. <laughs> uh, make sure you're a good writer. Make sure you can talk to people. You know, uh, I don't know. Just being able to communicate with people, I think, is obviously I'm biased. This is my job being a communicator, but <laughs> uh, that's what I would say. You know, I I was going to say something similar. Like one of the things that I didn't really know until later was that I could just reach out to people and ask them questions and ask for help. Um, I know it, it always seems scary to do it, but like in my experience, I've reached out to a lot of people that I thought were like unattainables, right? And they wrote me back and they helped me and in, in whatever it was that I was trying to figure out. So I think don't, it, even if you're scared, just write the thing, go on LinkedIn, you know, shoot them an email if their email is available, like just shoot it off. The worst that can happen is they don't respond, <laughs> you know, and, and you're fine, so. Yeah, I had to ask, or I didn't have to, but I forced myself to ask for a letter of recommendation from a very highly decorated, award-winning Harvard professor that I had met briefly, and well, I'd, I'd sailed with him, 
But I just thought he's way too busy. He's way too important. He's not ever going to want to do this for me. And he responded to my email immediately and wrote me a very nice letter that helped me get another gig. And it doesn't hurt to ask, you know, mm -hmm. like people are actually pretty kind and cool. So it's always worth asking and reaching out. I guess I was I was reading that just a, a little bit differently. Um, what what helps being a, a mentor and and so we have lots of grad students and interns come through our projects and, and I really think one of, of the strongest thing is is I I I I never ask someone to do something that I wouldn't do myself. You know, so I think that the girls coming up, you know, they can see me doing things. You know, I try not to hesitate. I try to be super safe. You know, I try to role model, you know, how they can be. Um, so that's, you know, again, I just, I never ask them to do something that I would not do myself. All excellent advice. Um, one more question um, from Diana. Uh, but she missed, uh, Lindsay, she missed how you create an ice storm. So do you want to walk us all through it? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it's, it, you know, I, I wish I could say it was high tech and, and it was computers and gizmos and gadgets, but it's really not. It's firefighting equipment. So you have a pump and you suck the water out of the stream and you push it through a hose and it pushes to another pump on the top of an ATV and then you spray the water up through gaps in the canopy and you do it on a really, 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 really cold winter day in the White Mountains of New Hampshire and it comes down as a fine mist and if you do it right, it freezes on contact. And then it's like ice sculpting. It's really kind of cool. You just kind of go up and down this basketball size court, you know, and you put layer after layer after layer of ice, you know, on, onto these plots. So the technique is simple. The conditions are a little tough. Isn't that the way with a lot of things? <laughs> um, okay, I have one last question. Um, I want to know what's one thing that every adventurer should take with them? Uh, I've got mine. <laughs> I, I got mine. Duct tape. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, mine's an extra pair or several extra pairs of dry socks. Mm -hmm. I was going to say compass. And then I thought, well, that doesn't work well in space. <laughs> I'm not going to work on that adventure. So I have to think about that one a little bit more. <laughs> I have to adjust the what I would typically say. <laughs> well, I definitely feel the dry socks could have used those in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. Yeah very important. You got to take care of your feet. And that's what comes in handy in almost every situation. All right. Well, that's been our show. Thank you ladies so much for joining me and telling your stories and sharing your advice and tips and everything. Um, that is our show, everyone. So thank you all for coming and hope you guys continue telling stories and maybe we'll see you at the next show. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming. Thank on. you for having us. Bye-bye.